Today we're going to be covering something that came up in the videos about Kleeman, um, which is the Okishio theorem. You may not know what the Okishio theorem is if you'd watched those videos, so I'm going to give a quick rundown on it and what the known weaknesses of it are quite apart from what uh, Kleeman has argued about it. What is the Akisha theorem? It's a theorem that was put forward by a Japanese Marxist economist in 1961 in which he used essentially a derivation of Sraffa's work to show that if you have an economy with equalized rates of profit across all industries, constant real wages, and an opportunity for balanced growth, then if you have all those three things, then any cost-saving technical change for a capitalist will raise the rate of profit for the economy as a whole. If you want a general background to this and the implications of it and the maths of it, I suggest you look at the Wikipedia page on Okishio. Now, why is this a controversial point? Well, it was seen as contradicting a certain generally accepted presentation of Marx's theory of the falling rate of profit. However, if you read Capital carefully, you'll see that this is not the only argument for a falling rate of profit that Marx gives. He gives one which is a technological argument, and he gives one associated with the rate of accumulation. And whilst Akishio may have damaged the technological argument, he has reinforced Marx's argument associated with the rate of accumulation, as I'll show you. <coughs> now, <coughs> what <coughs> Akishio showed was that Marx's original argument that if a capitalist invests in more capital investive te intensive techniques, which would give him individually a higher rate of profit, and if these were generalised, his competitive advantage will disappear and the overall profit rate will fall. That was an argument presented in Marx, and Akishio shows that that particular argument is false. But what about the evidence? It's all very good talking about these things in the abstract. Akishio was writing in Japan in the early 60s, when profits were very high. Let's look what happened after that. This is a plot of the rate of profit in Japan from 1965 to just to 2004. Uh, and as you see, there's a precipitous decline during the period of Japan's most rapid growth, during the, the boom when it was seen as possibly overtaking the United States. Uh, a very rapid growth and then a slower decline which has continued ever since. So, it's quite clear that that was a falling rate of profit in Japan. What gives? Why does this contradict or conflict with what appeared to be Akishio's arguments in 1961? Well, we have to look at the assumptions he made. Firstly, an economy with an equalised rate of profit. Secondly, constant real wages. And thirdly, an opportunity for balanced growth. Now, all three of those turn out not to have been met. Firstly, are there equalised profit rates? Well, we don't have... I've never bothered to compute the spread of profit rates in Japan, but given that every other country we've looked at has a widespread of profit rates, we can assume the same applies in Japan. And it would be quite exceptional <coughs> were Japan to be the only country that had equal rates of profit. So one key assumption of the Akisha theorem is empirically false. In 2000, or 2001, 40 years later, Akisha admitted this. He said, the theorem, as I put forward originally, is a form of comparative statics, a comparison between an old equilibrium and a new equilibrium. This does not have much meaning if the new equilibrium is not established. 
Whether or not it is depends on whether competition among capitalists leads to a situation where profit rates are equalised in every sector. Many people have tried unsuccessfully to prove the convergence of prices of production thus implied. He accepts that there is in fact no tendency to converge on a uniform profit rate. This is one of the key points that was being raised in our videos against Kleeman. Now Kishio himself accepts that there's no movement to an equal rate of profit. So one of the key assumptions of his argument doesn't hold empirically. Now what does this imply for capitalist investment? If there isn't an equalised rate of profit, capitalists can't use the average profit rate as a basis for making the investment decisions. The only uniform rate that they have available to them is the interest rate. It's the only general rate available for calculations. Now, the interest rate is what you pay to the banks and is quite distinct from the rate of return on actual physical invested capital. In addition, capitalists don't, don't know what other firms are making. They know what their own make, firm makes. They may be given confidential information about the foreseen rate of profit in another firm or another line of business that they're offered the opportunity to invest in, but they don't have a general knowledge of it. They can't look up the general rate of profit, but they can look up the general rate of interest. The Bank of Japan posts its rate of interest. Currently, the Bank of Japan base rate of interest is negative. It's minus 0.1%. You have to pay the bank to put money in it. Thus, any business undertaking that offers even a slight positive profit is going to be preferable to leaving money in the bank. Suppose a capitalist current capital stock is plant and equipment is earning him 4% rate of return on exploiting the workers he employs. If he's given the opportunity to take the profits that he's got resting in the, the bank at the moment and which he's being charged a negative rate of interest for leaving in the bank and has the opportunity of making even 1% profit on those. It's going to be rational to take that. Even if it's less than his current rate of profit, he will take it because the option is leaving the money in the bank and getting nothing or, or actually losing money. Now, let's look at the next point, a constant real wage. Well, Okishio recognised 40 years later, that there certainly hadn't been constant real wages in Japan. And in his second paper, he does a simulation of what happens if you do not assume constant real wages and you assume that capitalists have to compete to employ labour as the amount of surplus value they invest goes up. He shows that the consequence of that is the rate of profit will decline to zero which is a much better representation of what's happening in Japan. Now, third criterion, balanced growth. Now, this is not always obvious as a presupposition of the Akishio theorem because people think of it as comparative static analysis. But comparative static uh, analysis of simple reproduction is a particular case of balanced growth when the growth rate is zero. The more general case was dealt with by von Neumann in the 19, late 1920s. And by balanced growth, he means an equal rate of expansion across all industries and equal growths of capital stock and employment. Now, it's easy to see that those are preconditions for the organic composition and the rate of profit to remain the same. If you don't have equal expansion rate across all industries, then the section producing means of production may be increasing faster than the section producing consumer goods, in which case the organic composition has clearly risen. So the assumption of balanced growth is a hidden assumption in, in Akishio's theorem. But Japan hasn't been able to have balanced growth. Its growth has been constrained by the population. 
Japan is a country with almost no in immigration and a declining birth rate and an aging population. You can't have balanced growth with capital stock growing at say 10% a year unless the workforce also grows at 10% a year and with an actually shrinking population. Japan's population is shrinking by about half a million a year now. Clearly that is impossible. Over the, the period, the birth rate in Japan has declined, the mortality rate has risen, and the result is that the workforce is shrinking. So it's impossible to have any balanced growth in an economy with a shrinking workforce. Akishio then, in, 19, in 2001, looks at what happens to his equations when you build in the rate of growth of the population. And he shows that if you assume a 1% rate of growth of the population, then using his original equations, amended by this change of the growth of the population, you end up with the rate of profit converging on 1%. It converges on the rate of growth of the population on the assumption that all profits are reinvested. Now, uh, David Zachariah and I have, in two, and, and um, Alan Cottrell as well, in two or three papers, have presented a more generalized version of this result of Akishio, which is to say, what is the expected rate of profit you get if you allow for the w workforce to grow at a particular rate, if you allow for the pro labour productivity to grow and you take into account the rate at which existing capital stock is depreciating. And we get an expected rate of profit, R star, which is given by the growth of the workforce plus the growth of labour productivity plus the depreciation rate divided by the share of the surplus that's being reinvested. Now, you can look at the paper by David Zachariah that I cited earlier to see the justification for this maths. But the important point is that if you take this formula and you apply it to Japan, that's the solid black line, you get an almost exact prediction of where the rate of profit is going to be two or three years later. So this solid line shift it along two or three years and you get the dotted line which is the real rate of profit. So the modified or generalized 2001 Okishio rule turns out to almost exactly predict what happens to the rate of profit in Japan. And the interesting thing of it is that it's actually independent of the rate of surplus value, which wouldn't be obvious if you're just taking a static analysis, uh, as in capital volume one, for example. Now, what are the lessons for this? You've always got to look at the assumptions of a theory. A theory may appear internally consistent and mathematically convincing, but how does it map onto empirical reality? You've got to check against the empirical reality. Then you've, before you go slating the guy, you've got to look at the corrections the author himself introduces to show what happens if you change some of these assumptions. Key points. The falling average rate of, is, of profit is not about choice of techniques. It's an issue to do with the accumulation rate at the level of society as a whole. If the capital stock is rising faster than the population, then the rate of profit will fall. If the reverse is the case, the rate of profit will tend to rise. You can't separate historical materialism from human reproduction. You can't separate historical materialism from the laws of population 
and demography that a particular mode of production generates.